Welcome everyone. We are excited to present Introduction to Clinical Trials for People with ALS featuring Benjamin Jocelyn, Clinical Research Project Manager at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Nicole Sammartino, Community Education Manager with the Les Turner ALS Foundation. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to give a brief overview of the Les Turner ALS Foundation, and then I'll turn things over to Ben for his presentation. The Les Turner ALS Foundation is the leader in comprehensive ALS care in Chicagoland. We provide individualized care, local community support, and hope through scientific research. The Les Turner ALS Foundation is one of the longest serving independent ALS groups in the country. At the Lois and Salia ALS Clinic at the Les Turner ALS Center, we are proud to be one of Chicagoland's first and largest multidisciplinary ALS clinics with the highest number of neurologists and dedicated pulmonologists. Multidisciplinary care that brings together an experienced team of neuromuscular specialists in one clinic to provide comprehensive support for people living with ALS, I think of the multidisciplinary approach as one-stop shopping. This means you'll be able to meet with each member of your care team at every single visit, minimizing the need for multiple doctor visits. Due to COVID-19, our patients and families have the option of clinic visits virtually or in person. Our Les Turner ALS Center at Northwestern Medicine is led by the most well-respected and successful clinicians and researchers in the field, advancing vital care and research in pursuit of life-enhancing treatments and a cure. Our Les Turner ALS Center effectively connects the worlds of research and patient support to ensure the best care is provided and the brightest minds are working to find a cure. Today, Ben will start his presentation by telling you about clinical trials and their definitions. He will also focus on pre-screening procedures at Northwestern Medicine placebo-controlled trials, and we'll highlight the Healy platform trial. Lastly, he will talk about inclusion and exclusion criteria before sharing how you can get involved in clinical trials. Now I'm pleased to introduce Ben Jocelyn. Ben was born and raised in Chicago where he attended the Latin School for elementary and high school. He graduated from Colby College in 2012 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Neuroscience. With a pre-med major, he delayed medical school hoping to get more of a real world experience in healthcare by joining the Peace Corps and serving in the Peace Corps in Zambia for three years. His work focused on public health promotion, namely developing women's groups, fighting HIV and AIDS through sports and combating malaria. Ben returned to Chicago to pursue a graduate degree from the Northwestern University Program for Public Health. He completed his coursework and is currently working on his thesis. Finally, while pursuing his graduate degree, he was hired as Dr. Senda Driss's Clinical Research Coordinator. Together, they have grown her portfolio of neuromuscular research, namely ALS research, hereditary, amyloidosis, and peripheral neuropathy. Neuropathy, excuse me. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Ben. Welcome, Ben. Thank you, Nicole. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the Les Turner ALS Foundation for um, running these wonderful presentations and being uh, an ongoing support structure for the ALS community. Uh, I very much look forward to speaking to you all today. Slide. But I'm not alone. Um, I work not only with an incredible multidisciplinary team here in clinic, um, but I work alongside other ALS researchers here that are part of our team, uh, namely Emma Schmidt and Patricia Casey, who are both researchers who in, combined with my own have over 20 years of ALS research experience. Um, not only do we work on this research, but we work in hand, hand in hand with um, providers in the clinic, the neurologists, 
um, pulmonologists, um, occupational therapists, uh, as well as a number of other team members in our clinic. So research, uh, it's important to know, uh, it's a team effort. Um, and we in the Les Turner um, ALS Center at Northwestern are a team that's here for you. Slide. Um, we, so today I'm gonna to talk about the research at Northwestern Medicine, um, which is a broad range. Um, it's, it encompasses a broad range of work. Um, we not only do clinical trials, but we also do observational studies um, as well as natural history studies. Uh, and all of these things I'm gonna to talk to you today, but first let's get started with uh, a few definitions that will be important for you to kind of understand throughout our conversation. Slide. So when talking with researchers, it's important for you to be honest and open and to, to tell the researchers that you may not understand all of the terminology that they're using when describing studies, protocols, consents, um, and participating in research. It's a complicated and sometimes scary process for a number of patients. So when you begin, just make sure that you guys are um, discussing research on the same level. But hopefully this slide and our conversation today will be helpful to you uh, in terms of some of the research jargon terminology that we use. Um, the first word um, or term you should be aware of is an observational study. Not all research involves new drugs or new devices. Um, some research, like in observational studies or biomarker studies, we basically just follow patients over time. We observe them in the clinic and we collect data from them in the clinic. One uh, great example of that that we're doing at the ALS um, Center at Northwestern is the natural history study for ALS. And basically we follow patients in the clinic through the duration of their disease and we collect information such as questionnaires, um, information about their breathing, information about new devices that they start to use, but there's no actual intervention. There's no new drug, um, there's no new device that's being used. It's just to observe them in clinic. On the other hand, we have clinical trials and that's mostly what patients hear about um, in terms of um, what, uh, in terms of new studies that are out. And clinical trials are studies that are done in the clinic um, that are, again, with patients, and they mostly involve study drugs or study devices. But a clinical trial is not just one trial. Actually, drugs take a long time to develop. In fact, some take more than 10 years and hundreds of millions of dollars to develop, and they go through phases. You've probably heard about these, phases one, two, three, even phase four. And what you need to know about this is every different phase for studies explores different aspects of a new drug. Phase one, sometimes they look at a very small group of patients to see what is the correct dose for the drug, so that by phase three, you, we have a better understanding of what drugs uh, doses are most effective in certain patient populations. So when you're participating in a clinical trial, you may be participating in a phase one or a phase two or a phase three, but that will be explained to you at that time. What are we exploring when we go through these phases? Well, most of the time we're looking at study drugs. Study drugs are drugs that are not approved by the FDA, but hopefully one day they will be. Study drugs are drugs um, like, uh, for instance, levosimendin, which was a drug that uh, was studied by the pharmaceutical company Orion um, within the last year for ALS. They are not drugs like Radicava or Rilusol that has already gone through the phases of clinical research and were approved by the FDA and are currently being used by many of the ALS patients. Now, in these phases of research, we have a study drug but in order to see whether that study drug is working, uh, we have to compare it to something. And often what we compare it to is a placebo. And a placebo is essentially a matching, non-active comparator to the study drug. Oftentimes, it'll look exactly the same. So if you, the study drug is a pill, the placebo will be a matching pill, but the, the placebo pill may only contain you know, salt water or a sugar pill. Um, it will not act on your body in any way. And we'll talk more about placebos in a second. Now, when we're in a study and we're studying a study drug versus a placebo, 
how do we do this? Well, we follow a protocol. And the protocol is essentially the instructions for a study. And every single study, whether it's a phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, um, they all have protocols, and all of those protocols are approved by an ethics committee and by the FDA so that we can safely explore whether these study drugs are working. So essentially, when we say we have to follow the protocol, that means we have to follow the instructions for a study. Now, who is going to be in a study? Um, how do we determine which patients it, that which patients are eligible? Which patients is it? safe to perform certain procedures on them in a research environment. Well, in each protocol, there are what are called inclusion and exclusion criteria. And these criteria are a set of characteristics um, and criteria that patients uh, must fulfill in order to be in the study. Um, we're going to talk about some of these inclusion and exclusion criteria today for one study, the Healy Platform Study. I'll talk more about those later, but essentially, they are the rules that we have to follow and that patients must fulfill in order to be uh, placed in a research study. But patients are not just placed in a research study. We identify patients who we think meet the criteria and then they go through a process that's called screening. And screening is a process that every single patient has to go through in order to be in a study. And during that process, we do a number of things, usually blood tests, um, usually um, assessments, again, to see whether they meet or do not meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria. But let's say a patient does meet those criteria and they've gone through the screening process. Before they are put into the study, generally what happens is they are randomized. And randomization is a process in which a person, a patient, is placed into one of the, uh, the groups in the study. Maybe it's in the study drug group, or maybe it's in the placebo group. Generally, we do not know um, which group they are put in. That's called double blind, um, where the patients themselves and the study doctor, we don't know which group um, the patient is assigned to. And again, the patient won't know because the placebo and the study drug, they look exactly the same. And they should taste the same and feel the same uh, and have the same experience with the patients either way. Um, or in some studies, generally in the later studies, the phase four studies, because we've already known a lot about this drug, there may be what's called an open label period. And again, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later uh, with the Healy platform study, but an open label period, it's, or an open label is a, a type of a design for a study in which patients and physicians know that the patients themselves are getting um, the real drug and no placebo is involved. So these are just a few of the terms that you will um, hear about when you are talking about research with your provider, um, or you may read about um, on clinical trials or the Les Turner ALS website. So just um, hopefully this helps you understand a little bit more about the terminology we use in this field. Slide. So now that you are a little bit more familiar with some of these terms, let's talk about what we do at Northwestern in terms of helping patients get involved in research. Um, and there's actually a lot of things that go on behind the scenes um, with myself, Emma, Patricia, and a lot of the nursing staff um, here to make sure that patients are approached for the opportunities um, that they may be eligible for, for participating in research. So let's go kind of through the steps. You make an appointment um, to either as a new patient or a returning patient uh, at the Les Turner ALS Center at Northwestern downtown here in Chicago, okay? You are on the schedule and those schedules are put together uh, and they're sent out to all of our multidisciplinary team. So the physicians have them, the nurses have them, the therapists and researchers, we get the schedule, we know who to expect, who we're gonna see um, every Wednesday and Thursday um, in our clinic. Um, then myself and my team, we go through and we pre-screen, meaning we look at the eligibility, the inclusion and exclusion criteria for all of our studies, and we look at those uh, criteria for all of the people that are coming in to see whether you are 
eligible to perhaps participate in a trial, okay? Are you eligible for ongoing clinical trials like the very popular Healy platform trial? Are you eligible for observational studies like the ALS natural history? And maybe through correspondence, through emails or messages that you've sent to your providers or through the Les Turner nurses, maybe you've already indicated an interest in learning more about some of these research. And we basically, we take all of this information to determine whether patients are eligible or not. And we communicate that information to the remainder of the group. We have a large calendar and we say, hey, we want to see these patients to discuss their research options with them because they may be eligible and they should know that they're eligible for these studies. Or um, you patients can come into the visits and you can be proactive and say, hey, I heard about the platform study or I heard about this new Radicava study. I want more information about that. And, you're, and the physicians will then come and ask one of us to come and speak with you. So you can either be proactive about coming in with the research that you're interested in or play more of a passive role. And we will have done a lot of the work behind the scenes to determine whether you are eligible or not. Either way, um, if you are interested or if we believe you're a strong candidate for a clinical trial, myself or one of my team members will come in and speak to you about participating in research. Um, or if we're not available, we will communicate with you later. Um, and let's say we sit down and we talk about research and you're interested in participating. Sometimes you may go home with a consent form, which is basically more information about the study in lay language. You, you can contact us again or we can contact you, um, is sometimes the case, to schedule a screening visit. And that's where the process begins about actually participating in research. So just know that um, a lot of the things go on beyond uh, behind the scenes with determining and trying to find options for you as patients with ALS um, and your caregivers to participate in research, perhaps participating in clinical trials in which you would get a study drug or participating in observational studies where uh, you may not directly benefit, but the information we gain will indirectly benefit you in the future. Next slide, please. So a lot of patients come to us and they ask us about, you know, what is this about placebos? Why do we, why do we have to be in a placebo group? Why do I have to spend six months of my precious life um, and possibly be on a sugar pill or possibly be on, you know, salt water or a matching comparator um, that will not benefit me? And the truth of the matter is, um, and it's, and it's hard to say, it's currently the best model, the golden standard that we have um, when comparing these drugs that we don't know a lot about. It's the gold standard. And what we're trying to do is reduce bias, um, bias that could alter results. So if the investigators, if we, the study team, know um, what, uh, what treatment you are on, that may affect the results of the study. It may alter how we give questionnaires. It may alter some of the assessments that we do. So it's really important for us to be blinded so that we, we don't know and, and for the study team not to know um, what is being basically, what each participant is on. Um, so neither you nor the study team will know if you're on the placebo. Again, a placebo is a matching comparator. So generally, for the most part, you will not know whether you are on the study drug or the placebo. You may think you know, and that's called the placebo effect. You may experience um, certain, um, you may experience certain uh, side effects, if you will, um, when just on the placebo, and that's a psychological effect that patients have. Um, but you will not know whether you are on the placebo or not. Will you ever know? That's also a question a lot of patients ask. Not always, but sometimes at the end of a study, when all of the patients have completed a study, the good clinical practice thing to do is for the, the, the study sponsor to tell all of the participants whether they were on placebo or whether they were on the study drug over the course of the study. But that will only happen when everybody has finished the study and again, when um, the results are um, analyzed. Um, 
so what are your chances of being on a placebo? If I want to be in a clinical trial, you know, what, what are my chances? Well, it's it's totally random, first of all. It's a, it's a coin flip. It's done on a computer. No one controls who is in which group. And typically, um, it's either a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one ratio where you have you know, either equal chances of being in a placebo versus a study um, drug group, or you have twice the likelihood of being in the uh, study drug group as you do in the placebo. A lot of ALS research tries to skew um, the ratio to help um, give a greater chance of being in the study drug group, because obviously patients who realize that there's more likelihood of being in a study uh, drug group, they are more likely to participate in the research. Um, will I be in the placebo group throughout the research? Yes. Um, throughout the whole time, um, you will be in the same group, whether you are in the placebo group or whether you are in the study drug group. And at the end of the study, in a lot of studies, but not every study, in a lot of studies, they have an open label period where, again, there is no placebo, but patients transition into a real study drug um, only, study drug um, study or period. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the Healy platform study. And what are the alternatives to the placebo group? Well, just realize that when you participate in research, you are always volunteering. You always have an option. Um, of course, the first option is to always say, I don't want to participate in a study group or in a study of any kind. Um, another option is to pursue the currently FDA approved treatment. Um, for which ALS, there are two FDA approved drugs at the moment. Um, or um, you can, of course, decide to participate in the research and understand your roles and responsibilities and understand the ratio of placebo versus study drug that you may be randomized into. Now, interestingly, and um, something to really think about and that's very exciting in the ALS community is that future research may use models of the disease built from large databases. And what I mean by that is um, when you have a ton of information about the natural uh, life cycle of ALS, and that's information that we gather in observational studies like the natural history study of ALS that we are a part of here at the Les Turner Center um, at Northwestern, um, we gather huge amounts of data uh, and that data can be aggregated and create a picture, a model of um, ALS as a disease that one day we hope can replace the placebo group. So you have a model, a trajectory that you expect to happen when patients are not on a placebo, and then um, you have an actual study drug and you basically, you compare that model versus the study drug over a certain period of time and you see whether there's any benefit to breathing or ALS FRS questionnaires and so forth. But that is a few years away, um, but something that we're happy to be participating in here at Northwestern. Next slide. So we've talked a lot about um, participating in research here, some of the terminology we use in research. Um, now let's talk about a study that everybody is very excited about, and they should be very excited about, which is the Healy Platform Study. Um, what I will say is that first, um, we are very pleased to be participating in this study. We were one of um, just 50 sites that were initially selected to be a part of this across the country. Um, and we will continue to participate in this very exciting study. And what the study is, is it's different than what are traditional studies. Traditionally, you have one study drug against one disease, in this case, ALS. And you have to spend a lot, companies have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money developing these study drugs and developing um, the framework in which to study them. They have to go through phase one, phase two, phase three, like we discussed before. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of money. And generally 90% of the time, those drugs do not work. And so we've basically, we've spent a lot of time and a lot of money looking at drugs. Uh, one drug, and that drug didn't work, and you know patients had to participate in them. A lot of patients were in placebo, so that model, that model needs to be improved on, and that's what we're doing in the platform study. We are improving the model in which we look at ALS drugs. In this model, the platform model, we've built a whole new arena. We've we've built an arena where we can study three different drugs at one time for ALS. 
Currently, there are three drugs that are being investigated right now, but we're happy to announce that a fourth will be introduced by the end of the year. And not only do we have a fourth, but what we're going to do is because we have this model established where we have one master study um, looking at these different drugs, as new drugs um, come out, we can introduce them as new therapies. So you'll have therapy A, B, C, D, E, F. We'll continue adding new therapies until ultimately something makes an impact in this terrible disease. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the Healy Platform trial, it's, it's not only about um, the, the actual fact that we have multiple drugs. Remember, the importance of this is the framework in which we are establishing. We're establishing the foundation to, to, to look at and to study multiple drugs over time. But this is gonna help patients in multiple ways. Number one, patients will be exposed to, will have the opportunity perhaps to see multiple drugs under one study. So what does that mean? That means there are more opportunities to benefit patients with ALS. A patient may not have a good reaction to A, or you know, they may be in the placebo group. So after six months, if they're eligible, they can be randomized, screened and randomized to another group, perhaps B. And so if they go on with B, they may have, um, they may see benefits in that drug. So obviously, if patients are exposed to more drugs, um, they could have more opportunities to benefit. Another great opportunity is a shared placebo group. So remember, we have uh, therapy A, therapy B, therapy C, and therapy D. Those all share one placebo group. So there's, and because they share it, there's a smaller chance as a patient to be placed in a placebo group. Um, and that makes everybody happy. It's, it's much smaller than it was generally with um, more traditional ALS research. Um, next, there's a six month study. So it's just six months that in which you could be on um, the study drug or a smaller chance of being on a placebo for that six months. And then after six months, you are guaranteed, again, that open label, that term we've used before, um, you are guaranteed to be in an open label period after that six months in which there is no placebo, you're getting study drug. Or depending on whether you're eligible, maybe you wanna go back and screen for one of the other drugs. And that's something we would walk you through if you participated in this study. Overall, um, not only is it great for the patients in those three regards, but also there's gonna be a reduced timeline because we're studying so many drugs simultaneously um, just statistically speaking, we're going to find a drug that has positive outcomes in a shorter period of time. And there are shared costs. So um, we are, patients uh, with ALS are going to get access to these novel uh, new study drugs um, that are developed by smaller companies that otherwise may have been overlooked um, when you have bigger companies um, that are generally um, running larger phase uh, clinical trials. So again, this is the Healy platform study. What I will say in summation is that not only is it fantastic for patients as an opportunity in these regards, but really what we have to be excited about is the platform in which we can now load new drugs and test new drugs over a longer period of time until something finally works. Next slide. So let's go over um, inclusion and exclusion criteria. Again, inclusion criteria are the criteria that you as a patient have to meet in order to be in the study. And exclusion criteria are similarly also characteristics that you cannot have in your medical history um, in order to participate. They would make you, if you did have these, they would make you ineligible. I'll also state here that there are six inclusion and four exclusion that are listed here, but there are other inclusion exclusion criteria that exist, and they are going to be explored with you um, or patients who are interested in, the, in this platform study uh, during a screening visit. So the first, of course, is you have to have either sporadic or familial ALS. You have to have ALS. Um, you have to have a time since onset of weakness due to, uh, due to ALS for less than 36 months. And this is a, this is a really important one. Um, 36 months, uh, it is you know three years. And so patients 
sometimes it's difficult for patients to tie down exactly when their quote unquote ALS started. But what we have to do is we have to look at the medical records and look when, physici when physicians have noted, according to the patient, that this disease started. Um, and again, it's weakness. So you may have had cramping or you may have had pain for longer than 36 months, but the onset of your weakness is really what matters. And that's what we're looking at. But again, we have to look at the medical records um, and we have to follow what's in the medical records, not only what the patient reports. Vital capacity. Vital capacity is a breathing test. When you come into the clinic uh, for a, a clinic visit, you do a forced vital capacity. That means you breathe out as hard as you can for as long as you can. Um, and that uh, will actually help us measure the strength of your lungs. Um, we can either look at, for this study, we can either look at that forced vital capacity, or we could look at um, what's called slow vital capacity, which is you're breathing out, you're taking a deep breath in, and then you're breathing out for as long as you can. It's looking more at the volume of your lungs. But either way, we have to be above 50% in order to be eligible. And that's something you won't know um, unless you asked your neurologist. Also, in terms of the medications you're taking, you have to be on a stable dose of Riluzol for one month, or you have to be on a stable dose of Adaravone or Radicava for one month. Or in both cases, you have to be willing not to start those. And why we say that you can't start these things during the study is because it, will, it may impact the results. And uh, lastly, for the inclusion criteria that are listed just here, uh, you have to be able to swallow pills. And the reason is because one of the study drugs that we're looking at, there are multiple pills that are rather large that you have to swallow every day uh, for six months. So obviously we need to have patients in it who can safely swallow pills. Um, yes, uh, in terms of exclusion criteria, um, we do take lab, we take blood and urine samples from participants who are screening for this study, and we have to look at those lab results to make sure internally it's safe uh, for you to participate um, in the study. And again, this is something you won't know coming into the clinic, but it's just something you have to be aware of that you will go through if you're screening for the study. If you have cancer or a history of cancer, except for I think some skin cancers, um, it, you are ineligible. And that's this criteria is something that's used across, um, across clinical studies, not only for ALS. Um, and then use of study drugs within certain days or certain therapies, gene therapies for ALS. Um, again, what we're trying to do is measure the study drug versus the placebo. And if you have maybe you know, a study drug or gene therapy that's still in your system, um, that may affect the results. So that's something we can talk to you about um, if you're interested in participating. And lastly, of course, because we don't know whether these study drugs may have an impact on male and female reproductive systems, uh, generally in all research, it's required that uh, males and females use effective contraception. And again, this is something that we'll talk about with you. Um, so these are the key inclusion and exclusion criteria for the platform. Again, I wanna reiterate that this is not, these are not all of the criteria. Um, and also I, I wanna reiterate that there is a lot of attention paid to um, the time of onset of weakness uh, and vital capacity. Um, and these things are just, these are criteria that um, warrant a larger discussion with the study teams. If you're interested in participating, we'd be happy to explain more. Next slide. All right, so we've spoken a lot today about the terminology of uh, you know, certain research lingo. Uh, we've talked about um, my study team and kind of the, the processes that we do um, to pre-screen and, and, and approach patients who may want to participate and who are eligible and participating in research. We've talked about this very exciting opportunity, which is um, the Healy platform study and, and the criteria that it will take in order to participate. Um, but I also wanted to put together this slide to tell you about how you can get involved um, in clinical trials. It's a lot to think about today. And the first thing to know is that the Les Turner ALS Foundation um, and you know, our clinic here is to support you. Um, and so what we wanna do is just mention to you that you can ask your neurologists about studies you're eligible for. 
Um, when you come in for your clinic visit, say, hey, I want to talk to a researcher. I want to talk about what studies I can, I can participate in that may benefit me or may benefit other patients with ALS, and we'd be happy to come in and talk to you. Um, I hope that this web, I hope that this PowerPoint is shared. I'm sure it will be. Um, so uh, I recommend also taking a look at the Les Turner ALS Center website. Um, Nicole and a member, a number of people on their staff have done a great job redefining this website and also um, adding links to um, IMALS and some of the other wonderful resources out there for patients with ALS. Um, so not only here, not only are we here to support you, but the Les Turner ALS Foundation, of course, they are there to support you and they are there to help you participate in studies. Um, oftentimes I'm approached by um, home health nurses um, that say, hey, um, you know, this patient asked about a research study, can you reach out to them? And we're happy to do that. Again, we're part of a larger team here um, that are trying to help link patients with research opportunities they may be eligible for. Again, um, highly recommend looking at the Les Turner ALS Foundation website and also just see the additional resources link um, on the right hand side of the website and that will give you tons of other um, things to look at. Um, and then finally, other organizations. Um, NEALS is a, found, is a fantastic um, organization that we are a partnering uh, organization with. Um, we participate in a number of the NEALS uh, clinical trials and observational studies, including ANSWER ALS, which um, over 70 people at um, our clinic participated in, and we're grateful for that. Um, IMALS is also another fantastic resource I highly recommend. And then lastly, clinicaltrials.gov. It's kind of, it's, a, it's a, a website that was put together by the NIH and the FDA, and essentially every single ALS research study um, that's being conducted throughout the country has to be listed on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and on clinicaltrials.gov, when you look at um, a certain a study page, you'll see participating sites. And if we're not one of the participating sites, um, there's contact information for those participating sites. You can reach out to them to see if maybe you want to participate there. Um, so again, hopefully these resources help you uh, get involved with clinical trials. Next slide. Thank you so much, Ben. You really provided a nice foundation for our understanding of clinical trials for people impacted by ALS. A lot of great information there. Um, now, I wanted to get um, some answers from you, Ben, to some questions that we received ahead of time. Uh, the first question we received was, will my safety and privacy be protected? Yes, absolutely. Um, when we go through uh, the consent process. When we talk to patients about participating in research, there is a whole portion of that consent form that's in very basic, very lay language about how we take your privacy and your safety um, very seriously. And that privacy and safety, um, it, those uh, guidelines are established by our own institutional review board, our IRB, that monitors us to make sure that we are uh, following the rules. So for instance, um, when you participate in research, um, we never use your name. Your name will only appear on the consent form. It's basically you saying, I give permission to uh, participate in this research. Apart from that, your name should not appear very often, if at all, in research. And what you've become is you're actually given a number. And so we de-identify it saying, we're, I, we're removing your identity um, so that people cannot learn things about you in the research. Um, so yes, we, we make sure that your safety and your um, privacy, most importantly, is protected. That's helpful. Thank you, Ben. So the next question is, what are the risks and benefits of participating in clinical trials? And I know you touched on this a little bit. If you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll say this first, every single study um, whether it's an observational study or a clinical trial, they come with different risks and different benefits. And a good researcher, um, we will explain to you those risks and benefits as part of the informed consent process before, during the screening visit, before you start participating. Um, and it's hard to say uh, definitively what are the risks, what are the benefits. But generally, what I would say is, 
um, in ALS research and clinical trials in which we're looking at a, a novel drug, a study drug, um, obviously the benefits we will promise you, we will actually promise you no benefit whatsoever. Um, but what we will say is that it may make you feel better. It may improve your breathing. It may improve um, your strength. It may improve um, you know, the duration of uh, you know, your life in ways that we can't even measure. But we, we never promise things. We, I want to make that clear. We don't promise that you're going to feel better. And we really try to mediate expectations when uh, participating because there are also risks in participating. And every new drug has different risks. And we have to explain those risks um, to patients. And not only do each drug come with different risks, um, risks that you maybe sometimes you hear on the television, hey, um, you know, this drug commercial is on and they talk about risks. Those risks are coming from clinical trials that we do. Um, so there are risks not only for the study drugs when you participate, but there's also risks um, in some of the study drug procedures that we do. When you do a breathing procedure, there's actually a risk that you may feel winded or you may, you know, um, you may feel tired and fatigued after that uh, procedure. You may feel tired and fatigued after doing some of the strength assessments. So there's both, there are risks for both the study drug itself as well as the procedures. But for both the risks and the benefits, those things need to be communicated very clearly and understood by patients before they start participating in research. That's reassuring to know ahead of time. Thank you. Um, what kind of preparation should a potential participant make for the meeting with the research coordinator or doctor? That's also a great question. Um, and it's something that we, we always are striving to do better on. We, we want to, like we're doing today, provide more information to patients, uh, whether that's terminology or a better understanding of the inclusion exclusion criteria, so that when they do approach researchers, um, they have a little bit more information um, than they did coming in. But what I will say is generally best practice, what we will do is when we talk to participants, patients who are interested in research, they should leave with or they should be emailed or mailed a copy of the consent form. And again, that consent form, uh, so definitely something I should have put on the, um, the terminology page. But again, that consent form is a very lay language description of the study, the risks, the benefits, the responsibilities of the patients. Um, and um, just by reading that informed consent form or, or going through it um, quickly before coming in, that will help patients be prepared for the informed consent process that they go through first when they come in for a screening. Wonderful. Our next question is, can a participant leave a clinical trial after it has already begun? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, always, 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 always. Patients are, um, patients are volunteering, so they always have the right to leave research at any time. It's important that patients know that. Uh, not only can they leave, um, but we make sure that they, patients understand that if they decide to leave, it will not impact their care at the Les Turner um, ALS Center at Northwestern or anywhere else. Um, it's not going to, no hard feelings, it's not going to change your status with us or the clinical care that you receive. Patients can, of course, they can um, choose to leave at any time. But what we do say um, is that we want to enroll patients who are serious about research and who believe in the research, and we want them, hopefully, to stick with the research for the, the duration of the study, unless, of course, there is a safety concern or something like that. We, we try to, to talk to patients who will really want to be in the study, not just um, come in and then leave, you know, if they don't feel like it's working immediately. Uh, and again, part of that is really by having a good discussion before patients start with the research. Mm -hmm. Very important. Thank you. So tell me, what is what does expanded access mean? Yeah, expanded access. Another uh, term that you hear often is called compassionate use. Um, and these terms are pretty much synonymous. Expanded access is the technical term for a compassionate use program. And what this is, it's, it's essentially um, certain certain studies. Um, certain companies are willing to provide their drug to patients who have very little options, as patients with ALS do, um, uh, on a compassionate basis in which we are giving patients 
these study drugs, no placebo, um, and we are following them in a clinical setting for safety reasons, but we're not collecting a lot of um, research data. We're not measuring the, you know, their strength. We're not measuring the breathing that we would typically do in research. Really what we're trying to do is give patients access to these study drugs in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. Now I will say it, it has happened, um, but it's not very common um, that it will happen. Hopefully we always, uh, we want to work with our partners to advocate for more compassionate use um, because patients who are not eligible for clinical trials, um, compassionate use sometimes is an option for them. Um, and again, we, we want to make available those study drugs for them because it may help, but we, we just don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And then we have our last question, Ben. What happens after a clinical trial is completed? Uh, well, hopefully the drug works and, uh, you know, and it goes to the FDA. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and a few months later, everybody's happy and the drug is cheap and, you know, people can get access to it and it's easy and it has a few side effects. Um, no, what happens after a clinical trial really depends on the results of the clinical trial. Like I said, 90% of these clinical trials, they are negative, meaning they do not meet um, the goals that they were looking at, i.e. there is no difference between the study drug and the, and the placebo. There's just no difference in whether it improves the breathing, the strength, um, and that happens more so than we would like. That's kind of why we're trying to launch the platform and get that up and running. But in the cases where the study drug is uh, positive, uh, as is the case in some of the Amelix um, recent data, um, that is a little bit more complicated. It depends on this, the phase of the study that, the, um, that they were in. But if it's a phase three study, which is called a pivotal study, uh, and the results are pro positive, what they do generally is they make a big announcement and then they say, we're going to pursue licensure with the FDA. Then the FDA spends a few months actually, so it's not right away, they spend a few months um, reviewing the data, reviewing the safety information so that they can create what's called the FDA label that will go on um, that drug. Um, this has not happened enough in uh, the ALS community and that's again why we, why, why we need the platform and why we need more clinical trials out there. Um, but it's, uh, you know, we wish it happened very quickly um, but generally, uh, there's a big announcement and they go to the FDA, the FDA reviews, and within a certain amount of time, that drug is uh, released um, to the community and uh, patients benefit. Um, and that's, that's really the ultimate goal here. Absolutely. Ben, we really appreciate you sharing your time and your expertise. Um, this was just really ex extremely helpful uh, to the people that we serve every day. And I wanna thank everyone who participated in today's seminar. It was our pleasure to provide this educational webinar for the individuals and families that we serve at the Les Turner ALS Foundation. Please stay in touch with us and we look forward to connecting again soon. Thank you. Thank you.